Oh, hey, welcome back to Comic Book News. I'm Dan Shaheen. I guess I should welcome you back to an all-new giant size edition. We've got some format changes here on the channel. Uh, as I've mentioned before, I'm going to do longer videos with a bunch of different reviews in them, I think, for a while. If you don't like one, yeah, you can skip around. That's the beauty of YouTube. So today on Comic Book News, we're going to talk about, man, a lot of stuff. We're going to talk about giant size X-Men, the new giant size X-Men. Uh, number one, featuring Jean Grey and Emma Frost. X-Men number seven. Uh, Action Comics 1020. New Mutants number eight. And X-Force number eight. We're also going to look back in time in our new back issue edition. We're going to look at the facsimile edition of Flash number one, two, three. A comic that is super important uh, in the continuity and, should I say, the muddled intercontinuity crises uh, that uh, have become part of DC Comics and Marvel Comics and just comic books in general. Man, in our graphic novel section, we're going to look at one of my personal favorites, what I think is an underappreciated gem from writer Warren Ellis and artist uh, Juan Jose Rip. We're going to check out Wolfskin from Avatar. We're also going to do a little bit of follow-up on... Uh, the story we talked about last time about Dan Didio. I got a ton of views uh, based on that, and there seems to be an awful lot of interest. People are wondering, uh, what's going on with Didio? What does this mean for DC Comics and the future of comics in general? Well, how about we find out today on Comic Book News? Oh yeah, we're back. Oh, I'm teasing it a little bit. We're in the Daily Planet newsroom. We're going to talk about who? Dan Didio. Dan Didio was the co-publisher of DC Comics. Does any of anybody out there know, does any other company have a co-publisher? I mean, usually a publishing company has a publisher. Uh, I, I've never heard of a co-publisher before, so tell me if you know if that's uh, uh, standard practice somewhere else, because I never heard of it before. So, um... There's been tons of news and tons of speculation. People all over YouTube and elsewhere speculating about what um, Dan Didio's departure from DC, try saying that three times fast, what does that mean for DC Comics and comics in general? Tons of speculation about, wow, is this going to be, is this signaling the end of DC Comics? Does this, are they going to license their characters out to Marvel or to some other comic company like IDW? I won't say that's impossible, but I don't think that this has anything to do with that just yet. Although it may come from similar roots. So, you know, let's take a look uh, over at some, uh, what I found to be the best piece on this subject so far from, uh, who else? Heidi McDonald over at The Beat. Um, she did a nice in-depth piece on this. I suggest you go check it out and read it for yourself. Oh, and what a coincidence. Uh, we're going to be talking about this. Because she titled this Crisis on Earth Dan Didio. How 5G was a crisis too far. So she's always said that we live in like the age of, of, of crises. That was like the DC, uh, uh, the new normal is like continuity crisis, right? And she talks about Didio and how he was a hardcore comics dude. Like he loves comics. He's written them. He's worked in them for so long. Um, and... And that he did a lot with comics, right? When 10 years ago or so, when they did the now infamous New 52, right? They relaunched, they did a weekly series of comics for 52 weeks, an entire year. It was not great. It was very, they were making it up as they went along, obviously, as everybody does. But in that case, they were just sort of shooting from the hip. Very forgettable. Nobody goes back and talks about those stories or wants to read those stories. But it was a hit in the sense that like, it just got people into stores, got them super excited. It was the relaunch of DC. Uh, you know, and, and she compares it here. The only thing more exciting than that was probably the Ultimate Universe, spearheaded by Bill Jemis uh, during his tenure at Marvel Comics. So she, uh, Heidi goes on to talk a lot about... Um, about this, about the, the history of these crises and these rebirths and these rejiggering of, of, of continuity. Like, for some reason, at DC, it's not enough for them to just say, you know, uh, this is a comic. 
uh, whatever, we're starting over new. They have to explain the continuity. Like they have to explain why they're used, why the old Superman used to be a lot stronger than the new Superman or has a different hairstyle or whatever. Like these things aren't just like, uh, in their universe, they're not just like, that's the way it goes, right? It's, uh, um, baked into like the, um, uh, the physics of their universe. Okay. And man, this goes all the way back, all the way back to Flash 123, which is why I'm excited. This ties in so well with uh, today's back issue roundup and the facsimile edition I'm going to review. Um, so, so Heidi talk, talks a lot about in here about Didio and his tenure at DC and, and, you know, how he was hailed as a conquering hero, but all the sort of things that he did were sort of a lot of flash and sort of fizzled out. Um, the, the wake of, of the new 52, those characters, nobody liked those relaunches. They were kind of jerks. They were so different. I mean, I had such high hopes for the Grant Morrison, um, relaunch of Superman, but it was just kind of unrecognizable. It was just sort of Grant Morrison going off in a weird, different direction. And the, quickly everything went off the rails and sales went in the tank. And, and that's the main thing that I want to talk about here. That's what this is all about. Sales, right? The sales at DC have been lagging behind Marvel forever. Even during this tenure of DC, even when these great things were happening, um, they were they were lagging way behind. So now, with they're poised to do this thing called 5G, like the fifth generation, basically like the fifth reboot again of the DC universe, where they were going to yawn replace all the existing heroes with like new younger versions of them and make them like retired versions or whatever it is replacing your entire line of, of of heroes like recognizable heroes with totally unknown new people has been tried before marvel did it and utterly failed with their marvel now thing and it's just not something that a lot of fans want to see sure introduce new characters and a new generation but do not try to replace clark kent with some new modern millennial version of superman that's just not gonna work especially when it's spearheaded by this guy right like i'm sorry but like his 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 uh mentality and sensibilities are are geared towards a, a, an older generation maybe it's my generation or whatever i don't know but like he spearheaded all that svengoolie stuff you may have seen those svengoolie ads long comic ads he wrote all those comics in there and and assigned himself to 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 comics right he assigned himself to the metal men uh, okay now any other series you're gonna get a metal man maybe is worth a six issue may probably like a four issue series maybe a six issue but a 12 issue maxi series where he's gonna introduce introduce the nth metal metal man nobody cares the execution is bad this was his pet project, and he overrode really high-quality creators like Evan Dorkin and Mike Already, who wanted to work on the Metal Men and would have undoubtedly created something special. Certainly something way, way better than this piece of junk that we're looking at right here. Um, so I digress. Dan Didio, we, we're not, I'm not going to miss you too much. I mean, you did what you did. I never agreed much with it. I never liked the fact that you were a co-publisher with Jim Lee. I really felt Jim Lee was brought into DC Comics. They purchased Wildstorm, not so much for anything Jim Lee ever did, not so much for any of the Wildstorm characters, which have proved that they can't relaunch them, even with good creative teams. Nobody cares. Um, they brought you in to bring get League of Extraordinary Gentlemen and ABC and all the Alan Moore properties back into DC through the back door when he had, you know, had refused to ever work for them again. That's what it was about. That's why he's there now. So now this is Jim Lee's chance. This will be very telling. If Jim Lee steps up and remains the sole publisher and spearheads an initiative, I, I believe they can make a difference at DC. It's not too late to undo this damage. But if he just leans back, if they appoint another co-publisher or a new publisher who is not involved with comics, doesn't know <clears throat> how to do this thing, this comics thing, they're going to be in for big, big trouble. So that's it for my news segment. Thanks for watching. Uh, now let's move on to some new comic reviews. And today we're going to talk about all kinds of comics. We're going to talk about giant size X-Men and X-Men, both of which I loved. These were by far my favorite two books of the week. 
and for different reasons. Um, uh, I, I, if this giant size X Men is a signal of what we're going to get with the ones that are coming, I'm on board, and we'll talk about it in a minute. Uh, Action Comics 1020 <clears throat> is continuing this year of the villain Leviathan attacks Metropolis, and nobody seems to care, including uh, including me. It's not great. We'll look at that too. Uh, New Mutants number eight. Man, we just reviewed New Mutants last week, and I liked it. I kind of loved it. It was innovative and awesome and fun. And now, and they poke fun at the fact that the storyline's flipping back and forth between that one, which is great, and this one, which is meh at best. They're really at risk of losing me. As much as I love the Hickman stuff, I, I don't want to be strung along with with a bunch of junk. Pull, do, publish it monthly and do the Hickman book. Do not not weekly with garbage shoehorned in, please. Uh, we'll look at uh, X-Force number eight as well, continuing this whole domino thing. Um, oh, man, and then we're going to get into uh, our back issue segment. We'll talk about The Flash, and we'll talk about Wolfskin. So, uh, wait a minute. Why would we talk about all this stuff? Talk, 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 talk. Well, we can look. Let's go look at the Million Dollar Comics game. Oh yeah, that's right. Here we are, Million Dollar Comics Cam. And uh, what are we going to look at? Well, wait a minute. These ones are great. I told you. I spoiled it. Let's save them for last. Uh, we're going to talk. Let's first talk about uh, the stuff I don't like so much. New Mutants number eight. I'm just going to open this up and say, you know, compare this to the Rod Rice artwork of the last issue. And I'm less excited. The characters not super interested in boom boom i don't know who why boom boom whose favorite character boom boom is but she's getting a lot of play in this book and other books which brings me up one of my gripes about this um new x-men paradigm we're in they've got all these characters to play with but it seems like we're seeing the same few characters getting repeated in multiple books um when there are so many to choose from come on give us some give us some more inf interesting stuff um Return to this is uh, we're talking about magma and Nova Roma and this other team of new mutants I guess that they haven't really spelled out why there's two teams. Is it one team and just half of them the old guys are gone or what? I don't know um, You know, it's serviceable comic storytelling. I don't want to I don't want to diss it too hard It's way better than the previous issues the previous villain issues. So I didn't feel quite as um, gypped I did like he armor here ripping this creature in half with her not bare but armored hands. I enjoyed that for its goriness. Um, and the storytelling is decent. The artwork is not up to, uh, not uh, on par with Rod Lyers. Look, come on. Come on, guys. Uh, but, okay. I'm going to be back in for the. Uh, New Mutants Outer Space issues. Not really fair of me to take it off my list or, or to, to not take issues if this is on my subscription list. So I think what I'm going to do is I'll take it off my list and I'll just buy the issues that I want as they come out. How about that? Okay. Uh, let, let, let's, let's stay on the X-Men tip with X-Force number eight. And uh, I'm liking the covers on these X-Force. They got, like the last one, it's sort of real like dramatic I don't know. They're trying to do a little more um, uh, drama with the, the the Domino character. You know, she was skinned alive, and they took her skin, and they took some of her luck powers. It's very actually kind of hazy how they did what they're saying they did. Like, how do you steal someone's luck? Does that even make any sense, even in an X-Men context? I don't know. I don't think so. This is kind of a filler story as well to me. Uh, the artwork... Is decent. The per Percy Benjamin Percy is the writer, and who's the who's the artist of this issue? It, it's the um, mm, Basil Dua. Never heard of him. I, I I'm gonna say it's decent. Um, not my favorite of the X books. Middle of the line. I don't know what more I can say. We get a lot of stuff with Colossus, and Colossus. I love that his character. I love his design, his look. I love the character himself. But they've turned him into just kind of a weird character. I don't know what's going on with this um, post-traumatic stress disorder they got him going through. 
Anyway, they've got all these domino clones who supposedly have like luck powers or her powers or whatever and can get through the Krakoan scanners. And oh, when you got a row of dominoes, you're going to knock them down. I wondered how long it would take you to get to that joke. They got there. And they're going on and on with this man with the peacock tattoo and this mysterious Xeno organization that uh, uh, is hates mutants. Yet another, you know, anti mutant organization. X Force number eight. Uh, I'm going to give it a solid. I give it a C. It's about average. I don't know. Okay, Action Comics. It's a super showdown. Evacuate Metropolis. Now, I was talking with. Uh, the guy at the comic book store and he's like dan you know you you know about comics you know about these old comic artists what's up with john romita jr we've talked a lot about him on this channel i think the guy is a is a fantastic comic artist as far as storytelling goes but he's taking some shortcuts and he's and he's getting a little bit sloppy on the rendering side or, or, or he has become that that's sort of what his style is like it or hate it, it's recognizable as him. The storytelling is always solid. I'm never wondering panel to panel in these comics what's happening. And while that might seem like kind of baseline, you'd be amazed how many... That's the sign of bad comics to me is that they just don't... They don't flow. The artist doesn't know what it means to tell a story in pictures uh, with some words. <clears throat> John Romina knows how to do that, but these pictures just leave me kind of flat. I don't know. Is it fair of me to say he's going through the num going by the numbers and doing this for a paycheck? I don't know that it is. Maybe this is, you know, the top of his work. There's certainly you can see his expertise reflected in the storytelling. As I said, the 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 panel layouts are, you know, good, and the storytelling is there. The action is fairly clear. You know what's happening. It's just, and you know what? This is Claus Jansen inks. You know, legendary Claus Jansen. So it's hard to say it's a it's bad inking. Um, I just think it's sort of uh, second level B tier work. This is a nice panel. I like this page a lot. This is where I go. Oh, there's Jansen and Ramita Jr. Right. This one's coming together. This is a nice looking page. You see, there's potential. I think some pages are sloppier and more rushed than others. I think some of these weird year of the villain designs are not that great. Although I am kind of liking some of this Leviathan stuff that's going on, the mystery of their city and stuff. It's a little bit interesting. Um, so again, I'm, I'm giving this one a C. I'm staying solidly on board with Superman and Action Comics for a while anyway, Bendis. I'm, I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. Everybody disses you and hates you, and I've had my share of hatred for you too. But um, I'm going to give it. A, I'm going to give you a shot in this new era of Superman. Okay, now let's get to my favorite stuff of the week. <clears throat> let's start with uh, X-Men number seven. I really, 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 uh, really liked it. Um, I loved the art. I thought the storytelling was great. I thought the characterization was right on point. Lionel Francis Yu uh, with Sunny Go on colors uh, are looking good. This is good storytelling. Funny character moments from Hickman, including some somewhat controversial stuff. Now, I pointed out in a previous issue, okay? This is Scott Summers' house. It's on the moon. Wolverine, Scott, and Jean all live there together. And in fact, they have adjoining rooms. They have three rooms that have doors connected to each other. What does that mean? Who knows? Uh, right now, but... Scott's about to go on vacation to Chandelar, of all places, where they, 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 in a recent New Mutants, they planted a Krakoan flower. And he's inviting Wolverine to go along. And uh, it's like, it's going to be great. They got, we'll be hanging out by the pool and chilling out. And uh, Wolverine's like, oh, the scenery in that place is something else. It sure is. And she, he says, genie in a bikini. And he says, Scott in a Speedo. Heh, <laughs> well, who could say no to that? Great. Is it a joke? Is it something more? Is it all tied in? It's nice and vague, but uh, not slapping you in the face with anything. It might or may not be anything. Mwah. Subtlety. I like it, Hickman. Hickman. Good stuff. Um, again, artwork solid. Storytelling solid. 
interesting stuff with Nightcrawler, who's one of my very favorite characters, I'm, and, and I think Hickman likes him too. Um, teasing some new stuff that's coming from him. In fact, an upcoming giant size X Men is going to be all about dedicated to Nightcrawler, and I think it's written by Hickman. I'm looking forward to that because, well, I don't want to spoil the giant size review that I'm going to do here. I'm not even going to give this stuff away except to say it's really enjoyable. Every page I liked. The artwork's great. The colors are different, but solid. They pop. The, 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 there's a lot of text, so it feels like a substantial read. Hickman, you're doing it here, man. Keep doing it like this, and I'm staying on, at least for your X-Men titles. Now, the whole idea here is that uh, 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 in this issue, too, there's a bit where um, many mutants in the past had their powers erased by Scarlet Witch during that whole House of M thing when she said no more mutants, right? And so all of those mutants are turned just back into humans and they still exist and they're still alive in the world. And so they have the option to come and face the Crucible. They have the option to come to Krakoa fight and be killed and then be reborn with their mutant powers and so we've brought in arrow who is uh i guess sam guthrie's uh, cannonball's sister i'm not sure somebody tell me um and apocalypse has assumed this sort of like dark father role and he's the guy who, who who's gonna fight and is gonna be the um the dude to kill you and uh and and to bring you back but you gotta fight and you gotta be tough and it was great and then you're reborn okay I, I i've talked a lot about how i don't like the reborn stuff this bit i liked if hickman is going to be playing around with the stuff these ideas in these different ways i'll give him a little more time i know the immortality thing cannot and will not last forever so um i'm gonna stop complaining about it for a little while uh as long as he keeps delivering stories like this and we end with nightcrawler telling scott after their they had a long conversation in here he thinks it's time to start a mutant religion now nightcrawler has always been um in more recent years the past 20 years i guess uh, been um treated as a very religious character a catholic i believe certainly a christian and um so now he's thinking about creating his own mutant religion i think that's what we're going to get maybe in the giant size nightcrawler that's coming out and man i'm looking forward to it um, speaking of which, let's go right into Giant Size X Men Jean Grey Emma Frost. Now, this was my this is my pick of the week, without a doubt. It blew me away. I love it so much. I expected to not like it. Um, you know, last week I reviewed the Wolverine number one, and it was a giant sized issue as well. Although it cost eight bucks, it was like a double sized issue. And I complained that there were two stories in it. And somebody in the comments is like, Dan, what's the problem with two stories? like be more specific about your complaints well the thing is um i didn't the, the two stories they were two separate stories with like separate cliffhanger and separate can't it wasn't cohesive it wasn't what i want out of a number one issue now this i didn't know what to expect and man do i love it psychic rescue okay so it is almost completely wordless we open up to this kind of stuff and just pretty panel designs and right away you go okay this book with the art for this book is not being rushed somebody who's taken their time or they wouldn't have taken their time with all this elaborate filigree or whatever you whatever you call it um and we get they the the, the kids discover storm as something's wrong with storm uh, we come in and there's something going on and this says in case you don't you're not fluent in Krakoan like me this is silence uh, psychic rescue in progress <clears throat> and the rest almost the entire rest of this issue is wordless and I am going to flip through these I'm just going to flip through it quickly I don't want to it's a psychic journey right it's it's Emma Frost and Jean Grey entering um, uh, Storm's mind and trying to figure out what's wrong with her. And, and, and it's all told in this sort of beautiful mental narrative, uh, visual narrative, uh, visual metaphors rather. It's all like, almost like a big dream. W wonderfully drawn. 
not much story to be told here, but I lingered over every page because they were innovative, fun panel designs. And man, this is hitting me with some solid comics. Marvel, uh, you've got a lot of lower tier artists on your team. Um, but uh, this guy, Dodderman, is not one of them. And I like it. If you're going to save your great artist to do giant size X Men issues like this, um, oh man, I'm on board. Save me. I don't want to spoil this, what this is. The last page kind of explains exactly what this whole metaphor meant and what's going on. I'll leave that for you, the reader. Man, did I love this. Um, what a great uh, week for new comics. I'm super stoked. Uh, and now it's time to do uh, our, our new feature, our back issue feature. We're going to talk today about um, The Flash, number one, two, three. Why is this important? This is the beginning of the multiverse in the DC universe or in comics in general. You know, Silver Age Flash was like a reboot of this Golden Age Flash, which was written by a guy named Gardner Fox, who also wrote this comic and references himself. I read this thing and I was shocked. I always knew this was the dawn, but I'd never read it's the dawn of the multiverse, but I'd never read the whole thing. But what? wait a second. We're talking, talking, talking. You know where we go. To the back issue cam. So, Flash 1, 2, 3. And just look at that. Imagine being in the 60s, being a kid, and uh, seeing this on the shelf. And you are super stoked, right? Um, it's a beautiful thing to behold. Uh, the artwork on the inside, uh, written by Gardner Fox. Art by, uh, what was it, Infantino? Um, uh, he, uh, yeah, art by Joe Giella, sorry, and Murphy Anderson, and Carmen Infantino. Um, the story itself, it's like the Flash. Basically, he's going, he's talking to a bunch of kids, and he accidentally vibrates himself into the multi, in, in, into a parallel dimension, and this is where uh, the whole birth idea of the birth of the multiverse comes together. And he goes, man, I remember I was inspired by reading Flash comics written by this guy named Gardner Fox. And he must have somehow tapped into your universe mentally. They, and then they go on and they have a typical kind of corny Silver Age adventure with the Silver Age Flash who's kind of, he's still fast, but he doesn't have his stamina. And they compare costumes and, and talk a little bit. Not too much interaction. And then the Flash is out of there. It's not treated as, as the monumental event that it really is. I mean, it's a nice long story though. Multiple parts to it as he fights, as the Flashes fight three Golden Age Flash villains. Um, uh, the Thinker, and the Fiddler and Shade, all of who I think we've some seen come back, except maybe the Thinker. I don't remember him in mod more modern years. And you know, when it's done, he's back and he's like, the only ones who would really believe it would be the readers of Flash comics. That's why I'm going to look up Gardner Fox, who wrote the original Flash stories, and tell it to him. He can write the whole thing in a comic book. And uh, man, I loved it. I, I really, I, I'm really get it now. Why? Uh, I really get it. Why <clears throat> this that 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 idea really clicked with people and they loved it. This was such a cool, fun thing to see a comic book character acknowledge that he's in a comic book and that uh, he was inspired by comics and read comics and for the art writer to reference himself. Very groundbreaking for. The year that this was published, 1960, oh my gosh, I can barely read this, um, 1961, right? This was the dawn of the Silver Age, and this is where, uh, like it or not, where the modern storytelling began. Um, speaking of modern comics, let's talk about a graphic novel. We're going to talk about Wolf Skin. I'm not going to go over the entire thing, um, but we're going to talk about it. This is a... It's, at first blush, it's like a Conan pastiche or parody, um, but but wait, let's not just talk about it. Of course, let's go check it out in the Million Dollar Comics Cam. All right, let's talk about Wolfskin. 
man, this thing is great. If you haven't read it, and I don't know many people who have, uh, you're in for a treat. So, <clears throat> first blush, it's like sort of a, you might think it's a Conan pastiche, and it definitely is. But it's actually, if you read it, it's almost more, reads more like sometimes like a detective novel. Like, like he himself, the wolfskin, is, is kind of a detective. Because each story has a kind of a mystery that he needs to solve. That's the trappings of it, or, or that, that's the narrative thrust of it. <clears throat> but the idea behind it is so cool. He's basically like from a berserker tribe. And these berserker guys, they're like barbarians, right? But they eat um, like magic mushrooms, these black magic mushroom, dried mushrooms that send them into their berserker rage. And then that usually like sends them into a rage for like half a day. But for some reason, this particular guy, uh, when he takes it, it affects him all day into the night and into the next day. And he wakes up in a haze and he's just killed and killed and killed. And he's such a monster that he's even been like ostracized. Um from their community and uh but he's the thing about it he's super smart really intelligent um and a great fighter he's and he's traveled because of his exile he's traveled and he fights with two broad swords but he fights in like an asian style so he fights with two a sword in each hand but they're these giant broad swords and that's why he's so humongous and of course, he's like, you know, he's the super fighter and he's the greatest. But in this universe they're in, there's all kinds of different tribes and, and, and people. Like he's, they're sort of Germanic. There's these sort of Asian cults that, that use, uh, Asian cults, Asian groups that use like poisons and different, they drink, they make a good point that, the wolfskin makes a point that, oh, you guys, the Noi, the Asian types, uh, you make tea to make your water safe we wolf skin we we brew beer to make our water safe to drink just that kind of like intelligence like real intelligence in a barbarian type character i really like that um because that that's the one thing he's super smart and so oh that's the other thing after he could comes out of his berserker rages um he likes to not just kill his enemies he, he eats their livers. He has have one of your women cook this for me. So they're kind of like he's kind of, they're kind of cannibalistic, and they take drugs, and they're crazy, <clears throat> but but smart and ethical. And this guy has real honor. So it's a fun story. The first story is sort of about these two warring Noi brothers, and you know Wolfskin's approached by by women. He's like, I'm not gonna get cock rot off one of these native dames. Funny stuff. Um, in this sort of barbarian, tough guy way. And we get the, the whole first story is, again, all about the brothers. I'm not going to go into it other than to say the artwork, gory and fantastic by Juan Jose Rip. This comes out from Avatar Comics. who do a lot of really gory, go, super gory, violent stuff. and But it just fits so well. Okay, and so here he's, finally he, he has to take his, he has to take his mushroom and he, he kill, he wakes up and there's all these people dead, women and children that he killed. And um, oh, that's the other thing that the, the, his type have a physical, um, sick reaction to anything technological. So when the, when when one of the Noi has like a primitive gun that they invented, he's like sickened by seeing machines. They make him physically nauseous. Just an interesting wrinkle. Um, and then the second story, which was published uh, separately, is one It's all about this sort of like other outcasts from his tribe, but they bear a certain mark and they're up to no good. And it's all about sort of like this town that is willing to do terrible things with their own children in order to make money. And it's all about the bottom line. And, and it, 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 they sell the, the sweetest fruit, I think they call it. And that ends up being like children. They sell their own children because they just because they want money and like this disgust wolfskin and uh, anyway fun things happen fun super violent um great action scenes moment to moment action scenes where we get like every move and piece all the kind of stuff that i love in a good action comic but rarely get to see um so man that's wolfskin i love wolfskin 
Um, I'm a big fan of Warren Ellis, the writer, all the stuff he does. He's currently writing uh, Batman's Grave, illustrated by Brian Hitch, and I recommend you check that out. You know, I've talked about that a lot. It's not getting a lot of love out there, but I think it's, you know, it's a, the most solid Batman book on the stands, most solid Batman book in a long time, and it's more the direction I would love to see Batman be moved towards. It's almost a hybrid between the movie version and the comic book version. It's just a little bit more realistic towards the movie version, but still maintains a lot of those comic booky things that make comic books so great. Oh man, I love comic books. Did you know that? You probably did. If you're watching this channel, you guys are one of the hardcore. Uh, you may already be a subscriber. You might not. Um, if you're new to us, please take a moment. Think about hitting that subscribe button, hitting that little bell and get notifications of new videos as soon as they come out. I'm just going to keep talking and talking and talking about comics. I don't need your donations or your Patreons or your anything. Now, I'm not begrudging anybody who might need or want those things. I'm not in it for that. I'm in it for the love of comics and talking about comics and talking with you good people. So thank you for checking me out. Thank you for being a subscriber. And most of all, hey, just thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.